The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Taking the Front Seat in Metastatic Melanoma Care, Guidance on Using PD-1 LAG-3 Platforms as Modern First-Line Options. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash NAR860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello and welcome to Taking the Front Seat in Metastatic Melanoma Care. Uh, my name is Hussein Taubi. I'm a professor of melanoma medical oncology at the University of Texas MD the Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And I am pleased to welcome my colleague, Professor Georgina Long from the University of Sydney and the Melanoma Institute of Australia to this panel discussion. Hello, everybody, and thank you for having me discussing these things with you, Hussein. It's a real pleasure. Welcome. I'm excited about this because today we will focus on the emergence of combination immunotherapy platforms as modern first-line options for the management of metastatic melanoma and really explore the implications of these combinations that are PD-1 LAG-3 based in a variety of treatment settings. After reviewing recent evidence in this area, we'll also discuss specific cases and discuss the nuances of uh, how we use these combinations um, and how we use practical dosing and also to discuss safety management considerations. During this program, we'll periodically share several resources summarizing practical aspects of immunotherapy combinations in melanoma. So please take a moment to download these tools before we get started. So let's begin. Uh, I think this slide basically summarizes almost the last 15 years of research in metastatic melanoma. And I find it really remarkable that you look at the impact that immune checkpoint inhibitors have had. And the first one was anti-CTLA-4 antibody, ipilimumab, showing improved survival for the first time in melanoma. And when you look at this curve, you find that that is actually now the lowest uh, the survival curve that we have because soon after ipilimumab was introduced, uh, it was very quickly outdone by anti-PD-1 antibodies and BRAF and MEK inhibitor combinations, and then soon after with the combination of PD-1 and CTLA-4. And it's really important to look at this summary because it also highlights the role of targeted therapy, where you can see that in the green curve, BRAF and MEK inhibitors do well early on. But then as we follow those patients uh, with long-term survival, we do see that immunotherapy comes up on top and that we still see some survival benefit with BRF and MEK inhibitors, but surely combination checkpoint inhibitors, in this case, epilumumab and, CT, uh, uh, and uh, nivolumab or PD-1 and CTLA-4 as the uh, combination that gives us the uh, best survival rates um, at, uh, at the five or now six and a half year mark. And then we're going to be discussing soon a newer combination, nivolumab and rilatinumab, which is a PD-1 LAG-3 combination that has shown uh, uh, activity and the promise over single agent PD-1, and we'll discuss that in detail. As you know, these are the NCCN guidelines, and now this combination of nivolumab and rilatinumab has been added as a category one as a preferred regimen in the first line setting for treating metastatic melanoma. So, Importantly, I think it's very relevant to have discussions like this because uh, if you look at the practice patterns in, in across the United States, and this is a study that was published uh, last uh, in 2022, almost 17,000 patients and compared uh, the patterns of use of immunotherapy or targeted therapy between 2010 and 2019, um, and you see that back in 2010, first-line immunotherapy was a lot less commonly used and targeted therapy was more commonly used. And we see that shift happen. Uh, and now we have a majority of patients being treated in a first-line setting with immunotherapy and a 25% um, that continue to be treated with targeted therapy. So you could look at that and say, well, great, a lot more patients are being treated in the first line with immunotherapy. But I look at this and I see a bit of a glass half empty component because there is a 38% of patients that are not getting first line immunotherapy uh, in 2019. So that is a discussion that we're going to go over uh, myself and, and Georgina so that you can uh, review that data and hopefully it will affect practice in the right way. So the goals of today are to improve our understanding of the current guidelines and review the evidence supporting PD-1 and LAG-3 platforms for metastatic melanoma, 
and equip you with the skills you need to develop personalized treatment plans that feature pd one like three regimens in the first line setting. And also we hope to provide some guidance on practical aspects of care with newer dual ICI regimens, including interprofessional teamwork, uh, immune-related adverse event management, and appropriate dosing. So let's look at the evidence uh, for pd one lac 3 combinations. And really more, most of it, if not all of it, comes from this large phase 3 study, Relativity 047. And to be exact, this was a study that was global, randomized, double-blinded, and it was a, a gated phase 2 slash 3 study, which we'll go over briefly uh, in terms of how that um, ended up operating in the study. So we took patients that were previously untreated, advanced melanoma with an ECOG performance of 0 to 1, randomized uh, 714 of them to either relatlimab uh, and nivolumab as a fixed dose combination every four weeks or to nivolumab alone every four weeks. And importantly, we stratified for factors that we felt were relevant at the time, lag 3 PDL1, BRAF, and AJCC stage. The primary endpoint was PFS by blinded independent review with secondary endpoints of OS and ORR by blinded independent review. So here's the uh, primary endpoint, and this was the two-year update, and we continue to see a very consistent benefit that starts really early and continues throughout with a hazard ratio of 0.81, uh, again, showing statistical significance. The median PFS was 10 months, 10.2 versus 4.6. We're interested in landmarks. So you see at the one year, it's 48% for Nivorala versus 37% for Nivo alone, and that persists uh, with a longer term uh, follow-up. Now, importantly, when we start looking at the response rates, I like this particular slide because it shows us an interesting pattern. So you look on the left is Nivorella, on the right is Nivo alone, and this is response rates. And if you look closely at this, you would see that about 10% of patients that were progressive disease have now become partial responders. So you almost took 10% that had essentially think about it as primary resistance and you basically reversed it with the use of this combination and that's where the benefit kind of comes from. And importantly, once you get a response, as we experienced with immunotherapy-based responses, the duration of those responses are very durable. The, the median is not reached for that combination. Now, when we look at overall survival, always an important endpoint. Uh, there was an early benefit and that kind of continued all the way as we follow this curve. Uh, but it has not reached statistical significance. The median continued to be not reached for the Nevo and Rela combination. I would note here that because the study was a gated phase 2 3 study, we actually had about 300 patients that were accrued later than of the first 400 patients. And that would explain if you look at that two to three year uh, period, there's a lot of censoring going on there, which really means that we need longer follow up before we make our final conclusion when it comes to the impact on overall survival. Now, as investigators, we were really interested in whether we affected melanoma-specific survival. As you know, our patients with metastatic melanoma, the median age is over 63, so patients could die of other causes. And indeed, when you look at what was the uh, melanoma-specific survival and patients that died specifically on mel of melanoma, you see a benefit that's a bit more pronounced in favor of Nibro-Andrella with a hazard ratio of 0.77. And then again, we see at the four-year mark, it's starting to plateau at about 60% melanoma-specific survival. For comparison, uh, Checkmate 067 had a 56% um, melanoma-specific survival at five years. So we're not there yet, but it's a really interesting um, a pattern to know. And then when we start looking at subgroups, we really ended up not finding a specific subgroup where there was more benefit or less benefit. So lag three expression did not actually matter. PDL1 expression, you could look at it and say maybe PDL1 negative patients or less than 1% may derive more benefits from the combination. But the AJCC stage did not matter. When we looked at the age, for instance, um, you know, older individuals, even more than 75 years of age, continued to derive benefits from the combination over single agent. And we, we looked at specific uh, melanoma uh, uh, subtypes, you know, like cutaneous, uh, non-acral is the vast majority, but we have acral and mucosal patients. We actually had a really good representation on relativity of 4.7. And you see that for acryl, for instance, the combination does offer added benefit, 
Uh, for Mikozo, I was surprised by the response rates on both arms, to be honest, because even 25% for single agent for Mikozo is a bit more than I would have expected, but again, it's 30% for Nipo and Ralph. Now, why do we care so much about a new combination that offers more benefit than single agent? We already had one in hand with Ipi and Nivo. And I think this is the answer, the toxicity. It, there is a vast difference in toxicity. Nivo and Rella as a combination does give you toxicity, and it is higher than single agent by about 10%. But what's important is, again, it's only 22%. And what you see below is the pattern of that toxicity, and it's almost an identical pattern. It's a higher incidence in general. Again, that's why there's about 10%. But in terms of when these toxicities happen, their uh, specific quality and how you manage them, it is very similar to single agent, which I think is a really important improvement in the field. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Long to discuss with us uh, choosing a combination ICI platform and VRAF mutated disease. Georgina? Well, thanks so much, Hussein. This is a really important topic, particularly in light of the data you showed earlier, where still in 2019, 25% of patients were getting VRAF targeted therapy as first line therapy. So let's look at this data and we'll start with the Dream Seat data, which was an American investigator led trial uh, conducted in patients across the nation, which was a very important landmark study. Before I get into that, about 40% of patients with cutaneous melanoma have the BRAF mutation. This is the V600 mutation we're talking about. Uh, it's particularly more prevalent in young people, and there are different subtypes. V600E, for example, is the most common subtype, but there's also V600K and R, which benefit from BRAF targeted therapy. So in this trial, patients were randomized to either receive immunotherapy, ipilimumab combined with nivolumab up front or be targeted therapy with dibrafenib and trametinib up front. And when patients progressed, were able to swap over to the other drug. What we can see from the results is a very clear benefit in overall survival at two years, the primary endpoint, when patients started with combination immunotherapy with a two-year overall survival of 71.8% compared with two-year overall survival for those who started with BRAF and MEK inhibitors of 51.5%. And this was a significant difference of 20% and a p-value of 0.01. So this really gave us the data and evidence, which we knew in clinic, that starting with immunotherapy is of greater benefit in the long term. You can see the curves crossover at about nine months, which is generally the average where patients may start to progress on targeted therapy. So now let's look at Relativity 047 and the combination of nivolumab and relatlimab. What we see is the subgroups by BRAF mutation status that no matter whether you're BRAF mutant or BRAF wild type, there is a benefit to the combination of nivolumab and relatlimab. What we haven't done is compared the combination of nivolumab and relatlimab directly in a trial with nivolumab and ipilimumab in the BRAF mutant population. So that's an unanswered question still. So let's now turn to a really important topic. We know that patients with advanced melanoma often have melanoma that metastasizes to the brain. What is the role of dual checkpoint blockade in patients with brain metastases? Now, we're specifically now going to turn to studies which were done in patients with active brain metastases. They were not treated. They were not stable and treated, either resected or treated with stereotactic radiosurgery. These were untreated brain metastases, so were very active. We'll start off with the first trial called the ABC trial. This was an Australian trial in patients with asymptomatic brain metastases. There were actually three arms to this randomized trial, but we need to just focus in arm A and B because they were patients who were asymptomatic. Arm C were patients who were on steroids or had leptomeningeal disease, uh, were very symptomatic. So let's just focus on the asymptomatic patients. Shown here is the overall survival, and we can see a clear benefit in the darker blue of the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab 
compared with nivolumab alone. Now, some of these patients in both those arms, A and B, had had prior BRAF and MEK inhibitors if they were BRAF mutant. When we remove those patients and just look at those who got immunotherapy up front, the overall survival not shown here was even higher and the benefit of combination was maintained. There was a second study, which is the Checkmate 204 trial, a much larger trial, but all patients only received the combination. So there was no comparator with single agent. Importantly, we see a very similar response rate in the brain to what we saw in the asymptomatic patients in ABC with a, a control rate clinical benefit uh, of 57.4% in patients who were asymptomatic. This was very similar to what we saw in the ABC trial for combination immunotherapy. Interestingly, patients with symptoms who were often on steroids did not do as well, but we still had a clinical benefit rate of 22.2%. On the right, you can see the intracranial progression-free survival. I want you to note the shape of the curves. Basically, if patients get to two to three years progression-free, they tend to do very, very well long-term. In fact, in the melanoma field, we call these patients pretty much cured or durable control. Uh, when we look at the symptomatic patients on the bottom right-hand side, we can see a similar sort of shape. Some patients have durable control, although the proportion is much lower. And shown there, you've got two curves. That is the investigator assessed versus the blinded independent review. Now, lastly, I just want to show this slide so that you can see the three-year overall survival across three different trials, all using combination ipilimumab and nivolumab uh, in asymptomatic brain metastases. But what you can see is the overall survival in the first study, the Nippet study, is from Italy is 48% at three years. For ABC, it's 57% at three years. That's including all comers, including those who got BRAF MEC, which we know they don't do as well. And then the last study, Checkmate 204, the US study, 72%. And you'd think, well, why are we seeing 48, 57, 72? And I want to highlight that it's a continuum of burden of disease. So for example, in the Nibbit study, they had a lot more patients with multiple brain metastases. Nearly 50% had four or more brain metastases, and they were actually larger. ABC had about 40% with uh, four or more, but they were smaller, 19 millimeters. And I've got there the number of patients who had prior BRAFMEC. And in Checkmate 204, only a third of patients had three or more brain metastases. So what the point of this slide is to show it's a continuum in terms of the activity of combination immunotherapy, in terms of the burden of disease. And then symptomatic disease is about the worst type in terms of trying to get control, but you still can get control in about a quarter of patients. So what about PD-1 leg 3? We've not actually have any results yet of a trial conducted prospectively in asymptomatic brain metastases. But what we can see from relativity Patients in that trial uh, either did not have brain metastases at all, or they were treated and stable before enrolling on the trial. But this is an endpoint that's of great use. This is called the time to development of new CNS lesions. And when you look at the curves in the green on the left is nivolumab. So you can see it is more, a quicker time to developing brain metastases, very small numbers. We're talking about 10% of patients compared to the combination of nevorella, which at two years is only 6.5%. So this is giving us a signal that perhaps this combination has more activity in the brain than, for example, nivolumab single agent. But watch this space. There will be data in terms of this combination in asymptomatic and symptomatic brain metastases in the future. Thank you so much, Georgina. That was that was an excellent overview of really uh, two important questions, the BRAF mutated patients and how to manage brain metastases. We're going to discuss some practical implications of uh, PD-1 like three combinations before we delve into cases. You know, when I when we think about practical administration of these drugs, I think it's it's not minor to consider 
the burden on the patient and the uh, and the healthcare system. And so if you look on the right, you know that ipilimumab and nivolumab is given uh, typically over about two to three hours. You have about 30 minutes for nivolumab, about 90 minute infusion for ipi at three milligrams. And that's given every three weeks uh, for four doses. And then you switch to single agent PD-1 maintenance. Uh, with um, uh, nivolumab and rilatsumab as a fixed dose combination, it is a um, a single uh, bag, actually, one bag that contains both drugs. It's given over 30 minutes. It's every four weeks consistently until progression uh, or unacceptable toxicity. Or in some cases, we may actually stop because of achieving uh, excellent benefit. And so it is a bit easier to, uh, to administer for both patients and clinicians. And there are considerations and ongoing trials looking at uh, delivering the combination as a subcutaneous infusion. So just wanted to, uh, to mention subcutaneous injection, I apologize, as opposed to uh, infusion. And you will see the summary and other resources will be available for you for down, uh, as downloadable references. Uh, so please download uh, those uh, uh, aids uh, for more information. And just wanted to go briefly over uh, immune-related adverse events. And I think that piece is something that for some of us that have been doing melanoma research for the last two decades, we learned it the hard way. But now that we know how to do it, I think uh, early recognition, uh, education of the patients and the staff can really help making sure that some of those toxicities really never make it to be high-grade toxicities. And I think that's really important. So this is a very general overview. So you see this is the grading across the board. Um, and, and grade one is obviously very early toxicity. Grade two is, is a very good Time to think about um, when to potentially hold treatment before uh, treat before the toxicity uh, escalates to a grade three, and then grade three or four becomes a place where you really need to initiate treatment with high dose steroids, potentially hospitalized patients. And I think, uh, you know, again, we don't provide here every one of the potential toxicities, but there are actually apps to help you with the grading if if your uh, your staff are not as familiar with that. I think it's really important. And then as we kind of start looking at combinations, I, I think it's important to mention that we don't really do dose reductions with combination immunotherapy. We either give the dose or we don't give it. So it's really basically holding treatment is more what happens than it is a, a reduction in the dose. And obviously, if you find your patient have, experiencing grade two toxicity, it may be good to uh, delay a dosing and see if the patient can actually get back to grade one before you treat them. And if it's severe, grade three or above, really withholding or completely discontinuing therapy may, may have to be done. Again, grade four requires complete discontinuation. With grade three or grade four, we've actually considered sometimes re-challenging patients after they get off steroids, after they have a period of time where they back to grade one or hopefully grade zero. But that is a very nuanced approach, and you have to be really careful. Some patients do recur their toxicities um, after they develop a grade three. So I consider the management of patients with metastatic melanoma to be absolutely a team effort, and it really takes uh, a village, I would say, to take care of those patients. So we mentioned on this slide the different specialists that are in involved, but I also will have to uh, bring in our own office staff, really communication with the patient, education of the patient. But also, again, as we go through this, we need the multidisciplinary team from pathologists, surgeons, um, our radiologists, our pharmacists. But again, we are talking about immune-related adverse events. And I have to tell you, I regularly reach out to our dermatologist. I became very good friends with our endocrinologist at MD Anderson because we really need their help managing some of the tough toxicities, always GI specialists, because with colitis, really doing colonoscopies uh, at the time of suspicion of, of uh, uh, immune-related adverse events, or even at their resolution is very important. So uh, I really highly recommend when you're dealing with an immune-related adverse event that you feel you know uncomfortable with or getting to a place that is severe, engaging our uh, colleagues and other specialties to help us with this is absolutely relevant and important for the patient um, and for our staff as well. So with that, I want to turn to uh, probably my favorite part of this, which is discussing cases with you, Georgina, and thinking about the uh, uh, different options that we have for immunotherapy in the first line. And so I'll start with uh, a case here, um, which is uh, a patient by the name of George, who was 58-year-old at the time of diagnosis of metastatic disease. 
um, was undergoing a, a physical for work with a chest X-ray that showed an abnormal lesion on the on the lungs, and fa ended up with a CT scan that showed uh, multiple one to two centimeters lung lesions. Uh, no other evidence of metastatic disease. Uh, they already did a staging for the brain, and it's negative. LDH is normal. Um, uh, as with all 58 year olds that live in the United States, has hypertension and a performance status of one. So the BRAF uh, mutation comes back as wild type. So how would you normally approach discussing the potential outcomes of immune-based combinations or monotherapy with this with a patient like that, Georgia? Well, a great, great discussion. This sort of patient, I would be happily giving combination a nivolumab, relatlimab. Um, and we also have the nivolumab, ipilimumab there, and we have PD-1 nivolumab alone. This is a sort of patient, uh, M1B, lung only, no brain metastases, uh, BRAF wild type, where you'd go in happily with the combination. You don't need to go up the toxicity, hasn't got brain meds, hasn't got liver meds, uh, hasn't got the BRAF mutation. So I'd go in with nivolumab and relatlimab. And I'd discuss the risk of toxicities, every patient. This is the main part of the consultation, actually, and following the consultation with our nurse is education about toxicities. We go through the most common ones, but we always say it can impact when you fiddle with the immune system. Any organ can be impacted. It may be rare, but just give us a call early. Let us triage it. Let us work it out. And then we'll get into toxicity management. I think that's the key. And the biggest issue facing the cancer field is toxicity management. Uh, any grade one, for example, hepatitis, I do not go in with my second dose. There are some grade ones where I hold fire. As you mentioned before, we don't dose reduce. We just simply hold fire. So I hold fire um, because remember, it's a bit of a switch immune therapy. It's not the drug killing the cancer. It's the patient's immune system. So if you've got toxicity, you know you've switched it on. You can hang back and you can delay us, delay the next dose, do an early scan after six weeks. There's lots we can do, but avoiding toxicity will help the patient. Uh, don't slam them with another dose. That will get them to their scan and get their immune system doing the right thing. So I'd go with the combination. It's now a question of PD-1 alone. It used to be, when do I reach for the combo? Now I start with the combo and it's more a question of, when do I go back to single agent? Yeah. Thank you, Georgina. That's like a gr all great points. And I will say it's kind of, those are, those are the cases that, you know, three years ago, you would kind of debate ipinevo versus single agent PD-1. And you'd say, well, one lung lesion, normal LDH, let's avoid that toxicity and give single agent. Um, how do you place that when it's against nivorella? I mean, for me, I, I think it's it's not the same question. It's not the same conversation as we used to have about ipinevo. Even when we did our subgroup analysis for relativity of 47, M1B patient had a 15% difference in response rate in favor of nivolumab and relatlimab. So I think within the presence of a phase three study showing you that you get, you know, a clear PFS benefit, a clear objective response benefit. And, you know, who knows in the future, we may see an overall survival difference. I still think those are patients that we would be kind of under treating if we did single agent PD-1. Um, I don't know if, the, if that would be your perspective as well. That's, yeah, in a 58-year-old, absolutely my perspective. Uh, I agree with you. Um, as long as there's no comorbidities, I mean, there aren't on this list, but, you know, as long as he doesn't have an autoimmune disease, et cetera, absolutely. We do have to remember that the combination uh, nivolumab and relatlimab, although much better tolerated than nivolumab ipilimumab, they have not been compared head to head though. I have that caveat. It is a little more toxic than nevo, but only a few percentage points in some of those uh, toxicities. So overall, it is uh, much better tolerated than the other combination. Um, and and managing the toxicity, uh, it feels a bit like managing anti PD one monotherapy. Completely agree. So uh, you mentioned this patient being 58-year-old, so I'm going to make it a little tougher for you. What if the same patient was an 80-year-old? What would you do? Look, if it's a fit and well 80-year-old, I would probably do the same thing, although it would be a bit of a longer discussion with the patient. There's, there is one thing. Elderly patients, we saw from the data for relativity, 
the 75 year old age group, they were a smaller age group. There were only 60 in the Nevo Rella, you know, compared to the other age groups. They did better on the combination. And, you know, there are 80 year olds and there are 80 year olds. I know some 60 year olds who are worse than some of my 80 year olds in terms of comorbidities and functional status. Um, so if they're a fit and well 80 year old, I would then in this case consider the combination. We do know that, um, and from the relativity data, that the combination is better in the 75 year old age and above age group. However, the one thing about 80 year olds we and above that we need to remember is the elderly patients is that when they do get a side effect, they don't have the same reserve as someone who's 40 or 50. So an arthralgia, I think, is a good example. There is a bit more arthralgia with Nevo plus Rella. There is. We see that in the trial data, just slightly more. But the arthralgia can really knock an 80-year-old for six. Yes, you can get control of it. Uh, but sometimes if they don't have the right supports at home, um, you just need to, even for simple arthralgia where you just need to start 15, 10 milligrams of prednisone, you might need to admit them to get them going just so that they can get up and moving. So I would just counsel, uh, in church, just remember that toxicities are really pretty well tolerated in fit elderly patients, but they can knock them for six. That's all. So I'd be thinking about those issues with the patient. How about you? I, I love that point about the social support, Georgina. That really matters a lot in this population, probably as much as their uh, ability to tolerate um, kind of some of the issues and, and completely agree on the arthralgia component. Let's change up the same one. <laughs> George, back to 58, but this time he has the BRAF mutation. Say Everything else the same. 58, BRAF mutant. What would you do, Say Now you're in the hot seat. Well, your, your presentation of DreamSeek, if I had any second thoughts, has completely convinced me. <laughs> so, I mean, again, that study was just an absolutely uh, incredible trial in that, you know, we always look for, you know, some survival benefit to convince us of using something over another. And this was not just some survival benefit. This was a 20% overall survival benefit, an absolute benefit. Um, so I, I think in my in my mind, it's a very clear decision here to use uh, a, a immunotherapy. Now, you know, CTLA-4 and PD-1 was the combination that was studied against first uh, against BRAF and MAC. And so I think that is if you want to follow the evidence uh, absolutely 100 percent and to a fault, I think it's all it's epinebo that's been compared single, uh, you know, head to head with BRAF MAC. And so. The only places I would consider treating with BRF mac up front is in patients that are riddled with disease coming in with, uh, you know, very symptomatic issues like really pain or obstruction of some organ. Uh, sometimes, you know, our first diagnosis of a metastatic disease patient is in the hospital and they get admitted with complications of having uh, metastatic melanoma. And those are patients that, you know, I reach out for BRF and mac because we can get a very quick uh and fast response and a tumor reduction that can put the patient on a different path. So that was a great discussion, Hussein. I'm going to change it up one more time. We've now got what if George has brain metastases? What would you do? Excellent question. And, and the fact is, at the time of diagnosis of metastatic disease, up to 40% of patients can have brain metastases. So it is part and parcel of our staging to do MRIs of the brain. This is different than live or breast cancer. We do it for asymptomatic patients to screen for brain metastases. And that is kind of how this patient was found to have one. And in that case, the data is very clear for the role of ipilimumab and nivolumab, as Georgina presented with, you know, three independent studies, con you know, conducted on three independent continents, showing very clear and consistent benefits for that combination in the brain. I think when it comes to uh, BRF and MEC combinations, we know they have a an impact, and, and we know that that impact is limited in time. I know this patient's BRF wild type, but Again, speaking of the use of BRF and MEK inhibitors for brain metastases, they absolutely have an immediate effect and they have a response rate of, you know, 58%, but a much shorter uh, PFS in the brain than they have outside the brain. So again, as Georgina mentioned, the idea of using uh, BRF MEK as a bridge may actually be an, an appropriate approach also for brain metastases. 
And one other comment on MRI, we use MRI brain every scan at three monthly intervals in those first couple of years of advanced melanoma patients. Uh, that's our routine imaging for these patients. And as we mentioned before, PD-1 lag three combos in brain meds. Watch this space. Yeah, we're we're kind of running a trial as we stand right now, and and we're you know not fully accrued yet. But that is that is just a space that need data to prove it. And just the one thing I'll say is relativity of four seven just did not include that population, so there is no evidence for or against PD one lag three as it stands. And again, as uh, as Georgina said, stay tuned. So my final take homes for this, um, and I think is saying we agree on this. Dual checkpoint blockade is without a doubt more effective than single agent therapy. We've got two trials that have supported this, Relativity 047 being the topic for today. Baseline biomarkers are going to help us in the future. We're working on that across the field so that we can select the right combo for the right patient. And I think that combination checkpoint inhibitor has not been optimized in many other cancers. We've still got a lot more work to do. The perceived barriers are toxicity. There are nuances that we discussed today briefly, but if we can optimize toxicity management, I think we could optimize combination therapy across the cancer field. And so we do use the recommended immune-related adverse event management, educate patients and make sure you have that lovely team around you. But more importantly, there are nuances about holding treatment for longer and remembering that the way these drugs work is very different to the historic drugs in cancer. Well, thank you so much, uh, Georgina, for an excellent presentation uh, and, and a passionate and convincing one at that. I have a lot of fun going through this discussion, and this concludes our exploration of the modern use of pd one lac 3 based combinations in metastatic melanoma. I hope you found this activity informative and useful for your practice. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Hussein, for having me. Great discussion. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerreview.com forward slash NAR860. This activity is supported through an educational grant from Bristol-Myers Squibb.